probably some uh, members of the um, EAC haven't seen. So that's kind of what we're going to be uh, going on with today. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, Lila to take a quick roll, and then Nolan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay? Sounds good. Okay. Tasha? Here. Jonathan? Here. Nolan? Here. Carla? Here. Lindy? Absent. Alyssa? Here. Jimmy? Jimmy? I'm here. <laughs> Lindsay? I'm here. Caitlin? Answer. Oh, that's everybody. Okay. All right. Um, I probably should. Uh, now we are uh, just for those on the on the phone. Um, uh, this is a. Uh, now that we're on the record, um, can I get you guys to introduce yourselves um, one more time, please? The, um, sorry, Lance. The whole um, the whole committee want to give our our names. Yes. Or we have been recording. We're yeah, recording. we are recording. Nolan, is that your okay. question? Y yes. Um, yes. Sorry. So, so um, what did I do? Roll call. Um, no, Lila just did it. She just took it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just say our names. Okay. Well, um, Nolan Cloud is chair of the Budget Advisory Commission. You want me to call on folks? No, Nolan. Oh, we, I asked Lila to do that. That was my mistake. Okay. So let's go ahead, and unless there's some changes to the agenda, Mr. Chairman, why don't you just, uh, why don't we go from there, and, uh, and I can kick us off or turn it over to you um, a little bit more about why we're here today. Um, sure, should we? Sure. Well, uh, first off, if folks had a chance to take a look at the agenda, it's on the shared screen. Um, if, uh, if you're happy with it, then I would entertain a motion to uh, approve. This is Alyssa. Motion to approve. Any second? This is Jonathan. Seconded. Okay. And uh, any opposition to that? Then we will, if not, then we will go ahead and accept the, the agenda um, as described. Um, so our so our purpose today is a work session around the proceeds for the recently passed alcohol tax. Um, so so we, we're you know starting with we have some language. Um, I, it, it might be handy for you to pull that up. The um, I think it's the file that was just sent out by Lila that's labeled as AO 2019-148S1 uh, as amended. Um, if you it, it's probably kind of handy for you to pull up on page three of that ordinance. It, it, there's a, um, a section that says the dedication of proceeds, and there's the three topics listed there. I think that that's probably a good framework for our conversation because um, it, it, the funding is, um, you know, there, there are limitations on how this funding can be used within the parameters in that ordinance. Um, and, and so the, the three topics, the three being funding for police and first responders, police related criminal justice personnel and first responders. Um, funding to combat and address child abuse, sexual assault, and domestic violence, and three, um, funding for substance abuse or misuse treatment and prevention programs, detoxification or long-term addiction recovery facilities, mental or, and behavioral health programs, and resources to prevent and address Anchorage's homelessness crisis. So it's um, not a bad idea to have that in front of you as a reference as we talk. Oh, there we go. Um, so, so, uh, so the current state of this conversation, Lance, um, can you can you give us, or or actually, if, or if um, anyone else wants to weigh in, because I think we've got um, um, at least uh, one or two assembly members maybe in the conversation. Uh, if if any, can you tell us what what the what the current thinking is on the on the use of the proceeds um, to to sort of guide our conversation? I can. I'll start, and then um, I think we have assembly member. Um, La France and Assembly Member um, Perez Perdia on the phone, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, where we are in the process right now is um, with the passage of the alcohol tax, there is an ordinance in front of the Assembly that talks about the structure 
of how the alcohol tax will be deployed and how the uh, receipts and basically the process for tax collection. Um, what the Budget Advisory Commission has been asked to do by the Assembly and the Administration is to look at the use of the proceeds. The, uh, if I recall correctly, the total amount of estimated proceeds coming from the alcohol tax that will be starting in 2021 will be around $12 million, um, be plus or minus um, that amount of money. So that's a, 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 an estimated amount from the Treasury Department. They may have something more current, but that's the, that's the number that I recall when we set the ordinance in place to establish the alcohol tax. So the process is in place to set that. The Assembly has had um, at least one work session on the possible uses of the alcohol tax. And there were presentations made by the health department, the police department, the fire department, and I believe there was some, pro, uh, some material provided by um, our municipal attorney as it related to um, activities in support of um, uh, uh, the legal side of the use of the alcohol tax related to how many of these issues related to um, the social issues related to domestic violence, child abuse, and sexual assault. So I asked Lila to send those presentations to you. I'm not going to go through each of those, but in essence, um, the general thinking was, when we established this, roughly a third of it would help go to public safety types of support and support of um, services above those services that are in first responders and police that are above what's currently provided. Generally, a third of it could be towards um, number two, those programs related to combating uh, child abuse, sexual assault, and domestic violence. And then roughly a third of it could be in support of homelessness um, programs, prevention programs, mental health and behavioral programs. Those decisions have not been set in stone. Um, that was kind of the general thinking on how the allocations of resources could be done. Through the budgeting process and through conversations like this, those decisions will be uh, sort of will be more formalized and more established. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of agencies that are interested and supportive of um, number two and number three programs that are supporting um, uh, the, the, some of the issues of, uh, in our community related to number two on this item and then number three. Um, on this item as well. So that, that is where we are in the process. Uh, departments have made their pitches. Nonprofits have expressed their desires to use some of these uh, resources to support programs that also um, are supported by the municipality. And so I think there's some, uh, some generations there. That's, that's about as much information on the decision-making process about the allocation of the alcohol tax that has been made to date. So I'm going to ask Assemblymember LaFrance or Assemblymember perez Perdie if they wanted to add more detail or if Desiree's on the phone, if there's something that they would like to add from the conversations from the Assembly side. Okay, hearing none. Um, do I have Assemblymember LaFrance or Assemblymember perez Perdie on the call? Are they joining us today? If they're on, they're, they must have joined by phone because they're not listed on the on Teams. Yeah, um, they, they did say that they accepted the meeting. But I also know that there's a, um, a, a another meeting going on with the um, Utility and Enterprise Committee today. So the purpose of this, Mr. Chairman, members of the BAC, was just to share with you the material that we have and sort of get this discussion started and to see if the Budget Advisory Commission had some initial thoughts as a group or individually, and then as we're getting into department budgets, this will get, um, uh, you know, once the Budget Advisory Commission thinks about where they think the priorities ought to be, um, and you can use some of the material that was provided to you, uh, we're going to look to you to give us some general sense about either how the money ought to be divided or if we have particular programs that you think the administration and the assembly really ought to be focused on as they're um, allocating these resources in 21. So um, that's all I have to offer. I don't have any recommendations from the administration on how it ought to be allocated. 
at this point. Okay. Thank, yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Lance. Um, so, so let's see. So, so the, the presentations that you sent, these are some of the kind of departmental pitches for use of some of the proceeds. Then we've got the uh, fire department, we've got the health department, we've got APD, um, and then there's a uh, was it the, the municipal prosecutor's office. Right. So, so each of these is kind of a departmental pitch, right? For right. Your use of funds. That's sort of what we're talking about. So, is was the fire department? Pitching the use of alcohol tax proceeds for wildfire mitigation. Exactly. Let me see. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm asking Lila to pull up the fire departments. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. And I don't believe so. Um, we might have picked up the wrong ones because I don't think this one can be used for wildlife mitigation. So. I yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna be surprised if it could. No, no. So take that one down. There is so, a. So it, go ahead. So, so I guess maybe beginning this conversation is, is thinking maybe maybe we can start from the top um, with the with the with the big picture on it and is is what the highest and best use of the funding is that meets the voter intent and um, and you know we have these these three broad categories. Where do we see the payoff? Where do we see the value? What are some initial thoughts that folks have? I'd like to open it up. Hey, Ms. Melissa. Um, so if I'm, I, if I'm understanding your question there, Nolan, it's basically what are my suggestions on how to use these funds? And I, I had a couple conversations with folks about this just um, to get some other input. Um, I think that Increasing the community service patrol uh, falls under the first, the first line, the first third of what we could spend the funding on in the police, first responders, etc. Um, they don't currently cover the entire city, so increasing um, CSP, CSP, yeah, community service patrol, um, increasing the number of, of people working for CSP, increase the number of vans, actually have them be able to respond across instead of um, within a certain area uh, that I think meets voter intent it keeps up our, our um, police department to be able to respond to um, other other calls um, that aren't um, that are kind of maybe more serious or those sorts of things but that was one suggestion I wanted to throw out there in terms of uh, where to put some of the funding okay okay community service patrol and that's an eligible use I believe that that falls under the public safety bucket, I believe. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, first, yeah, it would probably be somewhere between, the probably a first responder, I think, on some level. Does everyone um, on the Budget Advisory Commission know what the Community Service Patrol is, the, the, uh, what that program is about? We'll send you a link, but what it is, it, it's really a program focused to um, and it's north of Tudor, primarily in downtown. It doesn't cover the municipality, entire Anchorage area, or I believe in Eagle River. So, um, if there are individuals who are um, need help and they're on the side of the road, or they're um, uh, because they've been abusing substances or alcohol or something like that, or they just need help, um, they uh, that service is available to pick them up and either take them to uh, a, a detox center or some other type of a, a treatment facility, but it's really only limited uh, to areas north of uh, Tudor Road right now in general. But we'll send you some information on the CAP team. Now, I, this is Melissa again. I, I had a quick question um, as it relates to first responders and, um, and the intent of, uh, of the laws, um, how we're going to use alcohol tax revenue. It, it's not just for first responders broadly. It is specifically for first responders respond and, and their response to alcohol abuse in some way. Is that is that accurate? I would say yes. Okay. Okay. And actually, um, point point of um, clarification on on um, process, Lance. But but my understanding on on when we have these virtual meetings, we can't um, have like substantive chat going on. But you can use the chat feature to queue to speak. Is that right? That would be great. Like, like if you like if somebody types in, please cue me. Then, then I can call on them. Yes, maybe, please. Uh, maybe do that. So let's let's do that. Let's. Uh, that actually might be a neat uh, kind of a, a cleaner way to, to have this conversation.
conversation. And um, when you want to speak, if you want to, if you want to jump onto the chat, if you can, and ask to be queued, um, I think that would be, I think that would be good. Um, but uh, but I think that community control is probably like a, that's a fairly straightforward solution as far as as far as like as far as some of the need in Anchorage. Um, is there a sense that they're are they are they um, they're only working north of Tudor? Um, there's a, a sense that there that there's a greater need though for what they do in more parts of town and just better coverage more generally. If that's a question to me, the answer is yes. They also also are very engaged in when we do homeless camp cleanups. And homeless camp cleanups are something that's coming up a lot that have that have generated generated some some negative publicity and caused people to question the municipality too um, about you know what are they doing why is it why is this happening why aren't they cleaning up camps and and I think that there's there's probably some importance on that subject as well although there is funding in the parks budget for it I believe there is so right now they have a I think they have a team two teams and they have 14 full-time um, seasonals that help them with uh, camp cleanup between May or April and October. Okay, okay. Um, there, is a, there is an issue here that I think is a, is a um, could be kind of an 800 pound gorilla in the room is, is about um, the, you know, the, the, the role of police is something that's being talked about nationally in a, in a big discourse, and I think that there's been this uh, this, this defund the police idea, which I'm, I'm not not endorsing. Um, but but that but that, that I think that the, the budget that often goes towards towards public safety is probably going to be um, scrutinized to some degree, and I think that that might be something worth thinking about in this conversation. Is is um, is is that topic about more about funding for police um, and appropriateness thereof. I see that Jonathan is um, wanting to speak. Yeah, so um, I think that Nolan's raising a really good topic here, and I think one of the things that, that we should be talking about is actually how we use this money to reduce the demand for, reduce the demand on our police department uh, when they get called in for things that really are not criminal behavior and where they're not the specialists, and, but they're being asked to do the job because that's the tool that we have, right? Um, and so a great example of this is if someone is having a mental health crisis, or um, you know, if someone's having a mental health crisis frequently, we'll call the police, uh, they're homeless, and then the police have to come, and that's really not the best use of the police's time. Um, the person's not doing anything illegal, they're in crisis. And so I think one of the things that we have to be talking about is things like the Crisis Now model, which uh, is a model where um, it has three supports to it. Uh, one is there's a crisis hotline. Uh, the second one is that teams are deployed in a, uh, it's kind of a tag team group where it's a social worker um, plus, it's a social worker plus a peer support individual to go out and, and help that individual. And then there's also the third component there is a, a sort of a, a de-escalation or immediate um, mental health stabilization center. And that model, there was a trip by the Mental Health Trust Authority that many people went on uh, in December down to Phoenix to see that model. And it's been very successful down there. And what that does is it takes pressure off the police because the police don't have to respond. And you know, one of the things that has happened with that model is in, is in you know, thousands of interactions, they've only had to call the police a couple times. So, you know, very frequently, these people aren't a danger, the police aren't the right people to respond. And so I think that we should be looking as a, as a BAC and as a city for these upstream solutions, right, that then relieve pressure on other things. And so, you know, we should be looking for the force multipliers that, that make us even more effective and take pressure off the police, which frankly, if it takes pressure off the police, it's like giving them budget because now they can use their resources more effectively. Okay, with that, um, I'll get off the, the soapbox and uh, get out of the way. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, um, I, I really like solutions like that. I think that sometimes we spend 
on police departments and we start other functions that might be somewhat preventative of the need for a greater police presence. Um, Alyssa wanted to make a comment, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Alyssa. Yeah, thanks, Nolan. Um, I just kind of wanted to piggyback on, on uh, what Jonathan was saying and fully support the idea of helping to bolster other services that take pressure off of off of our uh, police department. I, uh, maybe this is old news to everybody else on the call, but I was um, chatting with some folks yesterday and learned that our police department actually has like a kind of a mental health unit. And so I was curious if we might be able to um, bolster that unit um, so that they could implement something like, like the Crisis Now model, uh, just in terms of utilizing what we've got and kind of transforming it rather than trying to create um, maybe something new just in terms of thinking that that might be more cost effective. Um, but, uh, but I also wanted to share that um, my suggestion about um, increasing the size of uh, the community service patrol, that, that was a big part of that as well as just, just like the two of you were saying is to take some of that pressure off the police, have a more appropriate um, unit respond and you know, free up police to be able to respond to other other calls that are coming in that actually do require a, a police presence. Um, so thanks for, for your comments, Jonathan, and Nolan, really appreciate them. Thank, and thank you for that, Alyssa. I am um, I'm, I'm putting on my I'm screen sharing right now. I think you guys can all see it. I, I um, a while ago I, I pestered Lance and his team for for some some data that I can usually work with on on our expenditures as a as a municipality, and I and I broke them into departments, and I, I still would like to, to turn this into more of a, a polished product. But what but what you're looking at there is a graph of all municipal spending broken into. Um, and this is off general government spending, so not, not it's just operating budget essentially, broken into public safety, which is police and fire departments versus all others. And and what 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 the and and I did it on a real per capita basis, so the amount spent per person adjusted for inflation. And and what you see from the orange there is that all other services outside of public safety have been flat and and in fact declining, um, and over the over the over much of this period of time. Um, whereas the public safety budget, while not like exploding, has grown um, and has grown somewhat consistently. So if you go back to 2003, the proportion spent on public safety versus versus what it was in, in 2019 and 2020, it, it's um, the, the share is much greater in the, in the public service uh, or the, the public safety realm. Um, it's not necessarily you know just looking at the amount spent doesn't tell us anything about the effectiveness of the service or about needs for reform that it might have. Um, but it, but it is something that's noteworthy that, that those public safety budgets do come somewhat at the expense of other departments. Um, the graph does, no, and Lindsay asked the question, the graph does not include um, ASD, it's only municipal um, spending. Um, uh, Sarah wants to speak. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, Nolan. Um, I really enjoyed looking at that graph because it really puts um, kind of a visual on something I've been thinking about a lot lately. and. I guess my question is, with that graph in mind, and with that investment of our funds into our public safety department, are we really seeing, like, with that increase in funding and compared to our other departments, are we seeing the outcomes we want to see as a community? Are we seeing, you know, um, reduced rates of homelessness, um, reduced rates of admissions for emergency rooms, for mental health crises? Like, but I think looking at that in the context of the kind of outcomes we want to see as a community and why we're even talking about these alcohol tax funds in general and where we want them to be spent, um, I think that's something important to think about and, and really um, trying to find those other data points too to see, like, is this investment really working right now um, to kind of contextualize the investment in the public safety department outside of, you know, the, the national political discussion that's going on right now. I think even looking at it from an economic perspective is um, interesting and economic and social determinants. Yes, uh, I, I think that that is a that is a very good point. Thank you. I think the, the broader point too about about metrics and outcomes. I don't I don't always know that we have a clear sense of what those are. Is that something with this conversation and the this, the proceeds of this funding um, being you know labeled as separate from other kinds of general funds? Um, do we? Should we think in terms of, of metrics and outcomes for it? Um, I, I mean, I feel like we should. Um, I, I, what do you? What's the? Is there thinking on that, Lance, about about measurable outcomes tied to this money specifically, or is that something that we ought to be recommending? 
I will speak of, uh, this is just my uh, a sense, is yes, there should be, and the reason is, is that um, every department has performance measures currently. Um, and so if they have a new program or they're going to change their program, um, and we do adjust those performance measures, they're part of our budget. So I would suggest yes. Um, when we start new programs or if we are going to enhance programs that already exist above what we uh, have, and I'll just, uh, you know, if we have a, uh, a, um, a department that has a performance measure for um, addressing the number of clients that they might have in a homeless shelter and the dollar numbers have not changed or the amount of clients that need the service have gone up, we can see that. Um, and so I would, I would offer that we should at least uh, entertain it if we are going to allocate these funds to any, de well, whatever department or even a nonprofit. I think the municipality, if we're going to grant funds to a nonprofit, we're going to want to know uh, the return on the investment. It's not only for the, for the administration, for the assembly, but for the, the taxpayer. So I think we do need to consider that. What those metrics are, I would suggest they need to be data-driven. They need to be relatively simple to be understood, um, but they can't be data-intensive. Um, so that's the art of creating effective performance measures, finding something that you can track, but not you're spending all your time collecting data um, and not performing the duties in which you're assigned to do. So those are my thoughts. Okay. Okay. Um, so let, let's let's keep it rolling. What other what other thoughts do people have? Um, so Sarah asked if uh, community control officers are armed or unarmed. I believe they're unarmed. Isn't that correct? I believe I don't know. I mean, I don't know. And I want to clarify. Um, I was confusing the community service patrol with the CAT team earlier. The CAT team can go anywhere in the municipality. The community service patrol is the one that's limited to north of Tudor. I was, that was my mistake. And to the list, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the community service patrol is unarmed. Yeah, I think that's correct. Oh, I was, um, Ms. Sarah, I was asking about the CAT officers, not the community service patrol. The sworn CAT officers. Sarah, I don't know if the, I mean, they're, they're police officers on the CAT team. I, I don't know if they're, uh, I mean, I suspect that they're armed with um, probably, I don't know, probably mace or something like that, but I don't know if they carry firearms. I can find out. Um, I just don't know. This is Carla, and uh, no one, I'm sorry that I can't figure out how to do the conversation. Um, I, hope, I hope you can hear me because my computer is really screwing up right now. But the um, cat team is not armed because I did have them respond to uh, – some homeless that are here in our area, and they had to wait for APD to join them because the campers were very aggressive people. So they were waiting for APD to, to um, escort them in so that they could handle it. Okay. Thank you, Carla. Um, so, con so continuing on the, the conversation, um, I think that it seems like a drift of comments talking about, about some of the, the types of measures that might prevent the need for more police presence or more of a police multiplier, dealing with some of the behavioral health and other kinds of calls that police get that are really not law enforcement per se, um, that might free up some of their time. I, I see that, that we have support for those types of measures um, so far. Um, what, what else is there on this? Gotta have some. I'm sure that folks have some thoughts on this. It's a pretty important subject for us. Um, Tasha, I think you want to say. <laughs> yeah, I figured that was easier to just type my name. Um, I am in favor of some more mental health services, specifically triaging what people's issues are, and then thinking of policing. Um, I remember a couple of years ago there was this big push to find um, facilities that had a number of calls to them, specifically um, looking at Beans Cafe and how many calls they were getting, that instead of doing that model, there was a push to have just a larger police presence there to begin with, which cut down on the number of calls, and I'd really like to see us 
take that approach with more areas. And um, I think it gives a sense of safety for everyone. Um, I've been in Anchorage for a little over 20 years, and when I first moved here, I had a, a very um, easy job that didn't pay a lot. And so half of the people that worked with me were homeless, either living in their car or living in the shelters. And some of them are still homeless now because they're going through this cycle of, I need a place to stay, I'm going through rehabs, the people that will let me stay with them are um, substance abusers. Um, so for me, it's very challenging to think of like, how do we just keep throwing water on the flame or do we find another way to address the problem? So that type of an effort, does that, does that doesn't that require additional police, um, I, I, additional police spending, don't they need additional personnel to have those kinds of arrangements like with the, like with um, Phoenix Cafe? Are you asking me, Nolan? Yeah, if you know that, if you know that first. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't immediately say yes. Uh, and I think the reason I wouldn't say that is because of, I think Jonathan had an excellent point. You know, it's where APD is applying the resources that they have um, and setting priorities to how they're allocating those resources. Um, so I don't know if more officers would solve the problem or a reallocation of the existing officers would solve the problem. I would have to ask the chief. But I do think Tasha brings up a, a point that when you do get a chance, Tasha, I think some of your uh, points are blended in with the presentation that the health department provided. So um, after this meeting or while you're making, collecting your thoughts, maybe take a look at that presentation. I think Natasha Pineda over at the health department did a pretty good job explaining some of the needs on the behavioral health side of um, and some of the direct public services that could uh, help people. So take a look at that one. Um, on the APD one, I'll sort of summarize it. It's in two areas, the CAP team expanding that and then providing some support for sort of non-sworn help. Um, and then for the AFD side, the fire department, they had a presentation. They have a team that's similar to a, a CAP team where they um, it has a blend of a, a medic, I think a social worker, and um, another individual. I can't recall the, the name of their team, but um, that, pres that thought process was presented to the assembly. Um, and it, frankly, I think got mixed reviews, not, not of the service, but who was providing the service of the fire department. So anyway. And um, Alyssa, uh, sorry, uh, um, Carla, did you want to ask a question about rehab services? Oh, I'm not on mute, I thought I was. Uh, I know that uh, we're talking about where we might want to spend money, and I think the CAP and Community Services are excellent candidates. I really do think that they're very helpful, um, especially for what the people in Anchorage want, but I know that we also have discussed and, and we know that's been in the news about the lack of rehab facilities or lack of services, maybe for those um, being released from jail or anything else like that. So I'm just wondering if uh, these funds can also be, the public was you know, basically crying out for some type of uh, uh, enhanced rehab services. So it's just throwing out places to spend the money in the end. Carla, the answer to your question is, um, can it be used on rehab? Was that your question? Yeah, or uh, enhanced facilities or enhanced services for rehab. I do believe it can, yes. Yeah, it looks like the language in it looks like it supports that. Um, I think Alyssa, you wanted to speak to him? Yeah, thanks, Nolan. Uh, I, I kind of wanted to follow up on uh, Tasha's comment, from, and it was really more of a question. Um, I was just trying to understand what you're advocating for or asking about on the, um, were you suggesting that we have just kind of a, um, just a general increased police presence around Anchorage? Um, or maybe I missed something where there were like specific parts of town where you thought that we should have an increased kind of patrol presence or I, I just wanted to kind of 
allocation per day that there just be an increased presence? I mean, I don't think people need to be like stationed there. I don't think that that's very helpful for visibility, but just frequent, you know, driving by or, you know, we've been really impressed in our neighborhood now that we're home all the time, seeing the bicycle cops, I'm like, that's kind of fun. And then I often wonder like, is that effective for viewing or like if something is going on, like could they catch someone if they're using their bike? I always have all these thoughts in my head, but definitely I think the visibility portion, I don't think it needs to be um, a sworn officer. I mean, I think community patrols have that same effect, um, just of the visibility. Awesome, I, thank you for the clarification. I, and I do really like the idea of, of having, um, using the community patrol, I think, for, for that uh, increased visibility of one I think that's a, a really cool idea. Awesome, thank you. And if you guys look at the um, police presentation that's, that's, that was uh, sent from by Lila, it, it, does, it, it does say it looks like CAP is a big, uh, big part of their request for the funding if they were to receive it would be the expansion of, of CAP. jump in um, a couple things uh, if you guys have when you get a chance to look at those presentations and then I think Lila can send you the link to the discussion that the assembly had <coughs> about some of their interest on this matter um, and then if you guys uh, as you have questions um, and then we will find time as we're building the 21 budget to sort of narrow this stuff uh, some of your thoughts down some of the comments I think that Carla made are I would, I, if my memory serves, are pretty much in sync with what I heard from, uh, recall from conversations at the assembly, which is the CAP team seems to be a, a pretty important and effective program if it could be expanded in sort of a combination of Carla's comments and Jonathan's comments of using the alcohol tax for programs that are uh, preventative uh, rather than reactive, but there has to be a little bit of both. So um, supporting social service types of services, um, uh, some immediate effect, and also looking at investing in the long term. And remember, these dollars are above the tax cap, so um, they uh, there is uh, you know there is that to be uh, considerate of, um, and that they um, are for new services not currently included in the 2020 budget. So as you guys are thinking about that consider those ideas as well. Okay. Um, Sarah, you wanted to be in the queue? Um, yeah, I think, you know, one thing that you know, when we're going through the process of um, talking about this alcohol tax, one of the biggest things voters wanted was um, an increase in treatment facilities, as, as Carla mentioned. Um, I mean, currently, to my knowledge, there are 16 detox beds in Anchorage. Um, that is woefully, you know, just not prepared for the amount of, of folks who not only come through Anchorage as a, as a hub um, from other places around the state, but we are just so under-resourced in terms of it, and any step of the pipeline to both substance misuse treatment and um, behavioral health and mental health providers. Um, and I, I don't think that solely the funding from this tax is going to solve those issues. I think when we're talking about prevention and capacity, um, it really seems like, I mean, even folks I know who um, do have problems and who do have health insurance are having a very hard time finding um, mental health providers in general uh, in Anchorage, and so not only mental health providers to, to deal with our one in, I believe it's one in five Alaskans experience mental illness. Um, so that's, and that's what we know. Um, so not only talking about mental health providers, but also talking about um, just our triage treatment. Like having 16 detox beds, that's unacceptable, I think, in my own opinion. Um, and we need to really be pushing um, more for that. And I'm not sure if um, Tiffany is still 
on the line and provide some more data. Um, I don't have those numbers, but um, yeah, it's still thinking about both our mental health provider capacity and then our um, immediate detox facilities. Um, I know CICC is doing some great work around that, but I think those are two areas in particular we really need to be thinking about. Um, we're talking prevention, um, mitigation of homelessness and crime. For that, Sarah, um, Tiffany is on the on this on this meeting, and um, so I actually wanted to um, see if you wanted to share some thoughts with us, Tiffany. Hey there, thanks very much. Um, I appreciate it, and I will say that I'm also just back to work um, very recently from having had a baby in March, um, and so I am getting caught up as quickly as possible, but also probably don't have quite as much data as I would normally have. Um, I will say that we definitely have a shortage of detox and treatment beds here. And as I mean, as well, like kind of the different, the space in between those, right? Like if a person gets into detox, they usually have to wait once they can get into detox. And then if they need to go to inpatient treatment, there's usually a gap between when they have detox and when they are able to get into treatment. So I think that that's a gap that we need to consider looking at. And again, and then usually they do have enough outpatient treatment services in between inpatient and outpatient. But just to kind of consider that full continuum, um, just along the lines of alcohol use disorders. I will also say that when we did a lot of the polling leading up to this, proposition and working with the assembly sponsors to create the proposition, we asked voters and people in Anchorage what they would be most interested in. And the top two things, I mean, a thing that we have heard again and again every time an alcohol tax is brought up is that people want alcohol to pay for alcohol. So they are really interested in having revenue from an alcohol tax pay for alcohol supports, essentially, uh, treatment supports, recovery supports, prevention supports. And then the other thing that kind of scored the highest that we saw was prevention of some of the harms that are related to alcohol. Of course, it's not only related to alcohol, but alcohol does certainly increase these numbers. And that, um, you know, prevention of child abuse, domestic violence, sexual assault, what we see in the second bucket on the proposition. So just to say those were the two areas that the people were most interested in um, and wanting to prioritize and just to say how cost effective prevention is, like we know prevention programs generally pay off sort of at a rate seven to one up to 20 to one in terms of how much, how far those dollars go as opposed to more downstream solutions. And I mostly just wanted to listen into this call as I am getting kind of back into the workplace and getting caught back up with everything. But also just to let you all know, we're working with a large group of organizations, nonprofit organizations, who are trying to come together with our thoughts about how this revenue should be spent. Um, not to say that we think we should dictate where the money goes, but just to say, as subject matter experts, here's what we think is the most valuable, here's where we can all agree, and this is across sectors. So we're talking with people in homelessness, people in child abuse prevention. Um, people in public safety kind of across all of the sectors that are mentioned in the initiative we are working this week and next week as fast as we can to try to lay out a plan to help the assembly and to hopefully be able to present at commissions like this one or committee meetings like the public safety the homelessness and the public health committees of the assembly um, so we don't have that yet but we are working on it and we'll definitely get it to you all once we kind of have agreement from all of our organizations so um so tiffany to, to um that, to paraphrase that last part that you said um your the partnership you're talking about is act, actually wants to wants to propose kind of a holistic um use for the funding to the assembly as as one one sort of package deal like this is the, the optimal use of the program when it comes to prevention, recovery, and the, the intent of the, of, of the tax? That is correct. Um, I know on the same day the tax was put on the ballot, 
there was also a resolution passed that Assemblymember Zalatel had proposed that talked about this public process. And so I know they're having work sessions and they put it to committees and they're going to be having town halls, but um, but they also mentioned in their subject matter experts quite a few times. And what we don't want to have happen is different sectors kind of uh, cutting out each other's legs from under us. You know, like I don't want to say, oh, treatment's more important, don't give it to homelessness. And then they would say homelessness is more important, don't give it to treatment, because we know everyone who works in prevention knows that it works better when we all are working together and can look at these things holistically. And so, yes, we are trying to come together to provide that subject matter expert to the assembly. Okay, that's really good to know. I think that I think that probably something that our group would be really interested in would be would be pretty thoroughly reviewing that and looking into it and offering our opinions as well. Um, so I, I think that that would, that would be excellent um, to get that, especially that, that type of expertise um, at the table. Super. Uh, let's see, I want to call, let's see, I think, I think we've heard from everyone on the BAC except for Jimmy. Um, so Jimmy, do you have any thoughts to add to this? You and I had exchanged some emails ahead of time. Uh, I've enjoyed everyone's comments. Um, I think it's obviously a complicated uh, question. Um, you know, I've you know been following closely, as I imagine most people in this in this group have been, kind of the the national rhetoric and changes that we're seeing and whatnot. And clearly, we aren't seeing the same types of things in the press here, local in Anchorage or Alaska at large. But we're also, you know, in many regards, a small community that you know. It's hard to say exactly what is happening. Obviously, there's no big complaints. So, um, but I uh, I love the idea of transferring resources to where they can be most efficiently used, and to the extent that we can stop yes. problems from happening before the police have to get involved, I see that as an excellent way to use our resources. Um, I'm by no means an expert in this realm, so I'm going to you know leave those exact things to people who have more you know insight into it, but um, you know, I think everything you've said here today is you know, helpful and uh, insightful, so hopefully we can find a good way to use these dollars that prevent crimes from happening before they happen. Thank you, thank you. I think I think there's, yeah, I think it seems like we're, we're, we're um, I think, forming a, a consensus on that um, to a large degree um, about about the use of, of funds that might be preventative and that might might divert the need for, for law enforcement to a large degree. Um, I think that's an important point. So we're wrapping up here. We've got five minutes left. I think this is just a one hour work session, I believe. And um, I think it's going to be, um, you know, asked of us probably that we, that we um, develop a, a resolution um, encapsulating our, our views. And I'm not sure that we are, I'm not sure that we have a fully fleshed out vision for it for this um, yet. And so, what what are some thoughts on on how we should approach this or how we should continue to engage this subject? Does anybody have anything they want to share on that or any ideas they want to share? Can I offer? Uh, Go ahead, Alyssa. I, I was hoping that we could put together um, a resolution that supports spending, you know, on on certain categories or certain topics that we've identified um, in this work session that we that we think are really in need of, um, you know, maybe our high priority for us in terms of funding or something like that. That was um, kind of where I was thinking that this was going, uh, but I'm also sensitive to the, um, to the, to not wanting to kind of pit one idea against another and, and those sorts of things, but I, I would like to see us actually take some action steps. Uh, in regards to making recommendations for funding. Uh, Nolan and Alyssa, members of the committee, let me just offer some uh, thoughts and some timing. So I do believe the Assembly and the Administration would be interested in a resolution. Um, there was not an expectation that that would come from this meeting. Um, it was an expectation that would come from the BAC, and timing-wise, I would suggest that probably um, maybe the, your August meeting would probably be the timely one. I think you should continue the discussion at your July 9th meeting. 
I'm, I'm, I'm also interested to see what um, Miss Hall and um, Sarah, how do you pronounce your last name? Oh, another tough one is Cleeky. Cleeky? So I'm going to go with Sarah and Tiffany. Because <laughs> um, I do think that having some of that information about, uh, some collective information from those partners that, that were mentioned would be helpful for not only the Budget Advisory Commission but also for the Assembly. So if we, as that material is prepared, um, uh, that would, I think, be informative to the BAC. And if you guys have information, additional information you are looking for, um, we can do that. But I think to Alyssa's point, some broad categories of agreement are seem to be formulating. But timing-wise, I don't think I need anything from you um, any earlier than your July meeting. I think your August meeting would be timely. From a budget perspective, departments will be preparing their uh, budget submissions and they're due to my office at the end of July. And then the administration will be sort of uh, uh, preparing their final suggestions through August and through September. So um, I think we have a few weeks to make a decision or make a resolution. So maybe collect your thoughts and Sarah and Tiffany, some of the information that you provided, do you think that will be available to the assembly committees that will be interested in it um, or to whoever your audience might be here in the next, you know, sometime around the first week, first full week of July or will that be too soon? No, that is, this is Tiffany. That is what we are aiming for. We are really hoping to have at least a draft, if not our final version, by July 1st, knowing that the safety and health committees are that day. Um, and so hopefully we'll have it by July 1st. I did hear that they were considering shifting their move meetings out until the 8th because of the holiday, and so it might be one week later, but certainly by your next meeting on the 9th. So, Mr. Chairman, what we could do is let's let's see what we have available on the 9th, and if you guys want to have a special meeting in July um, uh, to pick that up, or depending on the timing of the issue, we can just uh, pick it up on the 6th of August and be done with it. Because the other the other thing that's coming up on your list as a group, just for timing wise, is the assembly is also interested to know how the allocation of the CARES Act funds ought to be spent. Um, and so the two, frankly, are, are going to be connected in, in one way, and that is we, we probably have the ability to use the CARES Fund for some facilities, but we need some ongoing resources for uh, programs, and that's what the alcohol tax could support. So they will, okay. be, they will be blended together, I, I believe, at some level. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, that, and that's a, it's a good point, Lance. And, and we have heard of, uh, had a pretty, a pretty straightforward and clear request that our opinion on the use of the CARES funding is something that's wanted by the assembly. You know, and there's 156 million, I believe, in total CARES funds coming to the municipality of Anchorage. It's an enormous amount of money. You know, that's, that's more than more than a fifth of our, or probably it's around a quarter of the meeting's annual budget equivalent amount. That's that's going to come to us at once um, to be spent by. The end of calendar year, I believe, right, Lance? No, no, we have until I think we have, I think we have until March twenty one, but we have okay. we have time frames in which we have to spend the first tranche coming in. So there's yeah, so that's a pretty pressing issue that the assembly is um, is is pretty actively looking for for, for ideas and answers. So um, I so I would agree. I think we probably do need to have a work session around that. I would love it if. Um, if we had maybe at our July meeting, if we did have some kind of an update from from Tiffany from Recover Alaska um, um, and and from Sarah about about some of the, the, the proposal coming together about uh, by the partnership of organizations the sort of holistic recommendation that they want to make to the assembly, um, I think that that having an update on that or or a draft to look at for our July meeting would be it would also be something that would be really um, really useful for us. We will work on that. Very good, very good. Thank you, thank you, and thank, and thanks to both of you for, for joining us today. Um, so I think um, I think with this, then we're, we're uh, we can probably entertain a motion to adjourn, and um, and then we'll uh, be seeing each other on July 9th. Any um, motion? Motion to adjourn. This is Carla. Second. Second. All right. Unless there's uh, any opposition.
opposition to that, then I think we, we may be adjourned. Thank you for putting this together, Lance and, and Lila, and, um, um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Thank you, everyone.